Well, I've been stalling as long as I can, but it's finally time. I'm I'm doing the thing, it's the scene core, it's the, I, I'm making the video. And I know I said I would have this done sometime over the summer, but right as I was about to finish writing the script, after two years of being totally fine, I got the Rona. I'm fine now, but goddamn, did that suck? Please stay safe out there, dudes. This shit's not over yet. Anyways, before we get into this, I just wanted to clear a few things up. First of all, I don't speak for the entirety of the scene community. I know people will disagree with me on this, and that's perfectly fine. None of what I say in this video is gospel, and I am most certainly biased, so take what I say with a grain of salt. And going off that, even though I would love for you to be able to take something away from this video, at the end of the day, I have no control over you. I have no authority over what you do, and I would hate for you to give up something you love because some asshole teen on the internet with bad opinions and too much spare time said something you don't agree with. Come on, honey, you're too beautiful for that. Also, I apologize in advance if I come off as mean or rude. This is just a particularly sore subject for me, and sometimes there's just no other way to word things. That being said, I don't have a personal problem with any of you. This video is mainly to shed some light on an overarching problem. Also, fair warning to those of you who are sensitive to or triggered by any one of these topics listed here, because there will be discussions in parts of this video. I will be giving more specific timestamps and warnings, which can also be found in the description, but please proceed with caution. Anyways, with all that out of the way, let's get into this train wreck, shall we? feel like you're going crazy. Like what you're saying makes perfect sense, but everyone around you is speaking another language. Like, you think you've found this space full of people who actually understand you and share the same interests and passions as you, only to find out that they're the exact people who judged you, misunderstood you, and blatantly ignored the context and legacy of your culture. The very culture that you sought these people out for in the first place? Back in the day, we would have referred to these people as posers, but nowadays they seem to gravitate towards the collective label of scenecore. Now, scene and scenecore may not seem so different, especially with such similar sounding names, but hopefully by the end of this video, you'll not only understand the difference between the two, but why I personally believe that scenecore is disingenuous, disrespectful, and ultimately shouldn't be associated with our subculture. But to do that, you'll need to understand what the scene is, or was, its significance, and what it has to do with scene core. So, without further ado, let's get into it. So, what was the scene? Well, according to Wikipedia, the scene subculture is a youth subculture that emerged during the early 2000s in the United States from the pre-existing emo subculture. The subculture became popular with adolescents from the mid-2000s to early 2010s. Scene fashion consists of skinny jeans, bright colored clothing, a signature hairstyle consisting of straight, flat hair with long fringes covering their forehead, and bright colored hair dye. Music genres associated with the scene subculture include metalcore, crunkcore, deathcore, electronic music, and neon pop punk. From the mid 2000s to early 2010s, scene fashion gained popularity among teens, and the music associated with the subculture achieved commercial success in both the underground and the mainstream. Now, though this article covers the basics of the music and fashion, it still leaves out what was, and still is, one of the most important parts about being a scene kid, which is the attitude and cultural aspects. Despite their bright and colorful appearance, a lot of these kids came from very dark places. Whether that be broken or neglectful households, being a part of the LGBT community, poor mental health, or just generally not having a lot of friends. But through shows and the internet, 
this subculture gave these kids a place where they truly felt like they belonged and where they could meet others who shared similar interests and experiences. And at its core, this is what the subculture is all about. That even in this horrible fucked up world that forces you to grow up too fast, you can still have fun. You can still express yourself and you can still find love and support from those who are just like you. Who cares if it's silly and ridiculous? That's the point. Hell, even the music, which is the heart and soul of any alternative subculture, reflects this. Mostly consisting of bright, dancey instrumentals with goofy, over-the-top lyrics about partying and having fun. And even some of the lyrics that did come from a place of genuine pain were still things that these kids could relate to. Some of these songs were even about the scene itself and the camaraderie felt between its participants. My favorite example being Yellow Balloon by J.J. Demon. With a lot of the lyrics describing these themes better than I ever could, and it, it's just a beautiful song, highly recommend. If you're a scene kid, you haven't heard it, Funeral Disco, great album. And yes, there were a lot of awful things that happened in the scene. I'm not saying it was perfect by any means. These topics that I can't really talk about in Susan's Christian household were so ingrained in the subculture that it's borderline concerning. But that's not what I'm here to talk about right now. Point is, regardless of the vile bullshit that went down on MySpace, this subculture was built on a foundation of love and respect. So, call it cringe, call it stupid, call it a bunch of edgy kids going through a weird phase, but this subculture still means a lot to many people. And though its mainstream popularity was short-lived, the scene still left a huge impact on the alternative subculture at large, one that's still felt to this day. And with that, this leads us into the next part of the video. Oh boy. So, scene core is a bit of a curious case. On one hand, it introduced a new generation to the scene, in a way helping revive a subculture that many thought was dead. But on the other hand, I personally believe scene core to be fundamentally flawed in the way that it portrays scene culture and music, as well as contributing to the death of subcultures as a whole. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. How did we get here in the first place? Well, let's start with aesthetics. Now, aesthetic images and art are nothing new on the internet. In fact, they've been around since the very beginning. But recently, the way we view internet aesthetics has been heavily altered with the introduction of TikTok, among other things. And don't worry, we'll get to TikTok's involvement later on in the video. But as a result of this, instead of aesthetics existing separately from subcultures, those two concepts seem to be interchangeable at this point. Nowadays, aesthetics seem to be treated like fads, adding the suffix core to the end of random words and making outfits, mood boards, and other types of media revolving around this central theme. Now, I'm not going to pretend I understand this, or I know where this kind of thing originated from. Like, back in the day, the core suffix was always tied to music. Crunk core, for example, is short for crunk hardcore like hardcore screams over crunk beats, or even emo, which is a shorthand version of emotional hardcore, which is also a music genre, but I, I, I give up, I can't. Anyways, tangent aside, now that you understand this weird trend of TikTok aesthetics, how does scene core fit into this? Well, as you know, scene was a rich subculture full of history, music, and alternative fashion. So what is scene core? Well, Scenecore was essentially a bunch of kids on TikTok seeing this subculture and not really understanding it. They viewed it as an aesthetic more so than a culture, not bothering to research the music, the style, or the reason why it formed in the first place, instead attempting to turn it into something that it wasn't by adding things that weren't in the original movement, as well as changing the message behind it. Like the association with Japanese media, like Danganronpa and Vocaloid, Music that didn't correlate with scenes, such as hyperpop and the whole cringe culture is dead thing, which, you know, isn't entirely bad, but just kind of rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> and I just want to note here that it's perfectly fine to be interested in scene core and the new resulting aesthetic. However, my problem lies with those who claim that scene core is the same thing as scene, and those who use these new elements in messaging to ignore scene history 
and make this subculture into something that it fundamentally isn't. Now, I might be coming off as rude or nitpicky, but I I'm not done. The next few parts of this video are going to be specific problems I have with scene core and the way it portrays the subculture, and hopefully you can get a better idea of why I'm so frustrated. The reason I chose to start with this point in particular is because it perfectly encapsulates the disconnect between old school scene and modern scene core. I think this Tumblr post by user at Pixie Sticks perfectly captures what I mean. They made a lot of good points in the first paragraph, but I'll mainly be focusing on the second one. You can pause to read, but I'll give a brief summary. So pretty much the points they bring up are the fact that a lot of scene core kids misinterpret the scene attitude and like the core foundation of the subculture, because instead of embracing the whole cute and scary vibe, it seems they're trying to erase that aspect entirely. And I feel like that wouldn't quite rub me the wrong way as much if this wasn't such a hugely polarizing part of the subculture. Though the scene is somewhat known for being cutesy and fun, that doesn't change the fact that it originally evolved from emo, which involved dressing in all black and listening to very heavy emotional music. And though it's not technically about being sad, Emo was about being very expressive with your emotions, and since a lot of these kids were mentally ill teenagers, these emotions would often surface as anger or sadness or fear. And even though scene and emo are both very different, you can't deny that emo had a huge influence. That paired with the fact that a lot of these kids came from very dark places, and, as mentioned earlier in the video and the first part of this post, a lot of horrible shit went down on MySpace. And it was not the most fun place to be. And regardless of the fact that at its core, the subculture was about expressing yourself and having fun, a lot of scene kids back in the day were really mean. Like, even to the point that this became a stereotype. And I'm not saying that we should all start treating each other horribly, or start needless drama, or recreate the worst parts of MySpace. Like, absolutely not. That's not at all what I'm trying to say. The main thing I have a problem with is this weird surface level positivity, and the idea of you can't be mean and also be seen slash alternative, because no, that's just not true. Historically, Every single subculture had these aspects. Hell, the punk movement, which is pretty much like the first subculture, fundamentally comes from this idea of fuck society, fuck your rules, the world is messed up and I'm angry about it. And even though scene is extremely different, it seems dumb and somewhat childish to pretend that these people were always kind and accepting. Because sometimes alternative is mean and scary, but that's the whole point. It's not meant to appeal to the mainstream. I wanted to end this segment with a quote from Pixie Sticks post. Let scene kids be friendly while still reading you for frying your hair. Let scene kids read you without using race, sex, or gender as an insult. Let there be some goddamn nuance. It's not that hard. End rant. You were making noise before, but now you're quiet. I'm bringing my toys and they love it. You could probably rename this segment to A Whole Bunch of Bullshit. No, maybe, maybe that's too far. Can you stop? But in all seriousness, this segment does get really weird and triggering really fast. So, once again, if you're sensitive to any of these topics right here, please skip to this timestamp. You still here? Alright, let's get into it. Since the very first alternative subcultures, there has been one core element that bonds each of its members together. Yes, there's always going to be the fashion that a subculture's members will define themselves with, or a message that they rally behind, but the thing that really cements a subculture's legacy is the music, the scene being no different. Whether it be the iconic crunk core, headed by bands like Broken Side, Millionaires, or Dot Dot Curve, or cutesy MySpace bedroom pop like Nickasaur, The Ready Set, or Never Shout Never, or Neon Pop Punk, or Electronic Horror, or Full-On Electronic Pop. Like, 
Even though the scene was somewhat short-lived, there was still a wide range of genres and sounds, and even some artists who actually had a lot of talent. It lent itself to a truly influential legacy. So, you know all that stuff I just mentioned? Like, all the bands and the genres and whatnot? Well, throw that out the fucking window, because that's not what we're gonna be talking about. And you might be wondering, Maya, if the music was so instrumental in the creation and legacy of the subculture, then where's the disconnect? If these kids were truly invested in the scene, then they must have in some way found it through the music, right? And that's where you'd be wrong, my friend! It seems we've found where the main problem arises, that these kids fundamentally do not understand what a subculture is. But we're not there yet. Did you really think I was going to let you off that easy? After the hell I've been through? Well, we've done enough beating around the bush. It's finally time to answer the question of what are the kids actually listening to? And get ready, because it's not good. Also, brief disclaimer here, this isn't directed at hyperpop, which just isn't seen by any stretch of the imagination. Like, there's this misconception that hyperpop is on the same level as authentic scene music from back in the day, which I don't personally agree with. I honestly have a lot of respect for hyperpop as its own thing. I don't really get it most of the time, but that's okay. Clearly these artists have made this super cool, unique thing that resonates with a lot of people. And I think that's pretty cool. But once again, this isn't meant to be about anything that brings me joy in any capacity. While hyperpop is its own unique genre that seems to only be associated with the scene core aesthetic through an unfortunate set of circumstances, scene core music is a whole other thing. Because unlike hyperpop, which has actual substance, these artists make obnoxious garbage with awful vocal effects, extremely questionable lyrics, and oftentimes stolen instrumentals, melodies, and concepts. And as I said at the beginning of this video, most of the things stated here are my opinion, and you might be inclined to disagree. However, I'm going to try my best to provide reasoning and examples as to why me and so many others strongly dislike this type of music. Well, Malice, you've hyped it up this much. So what does the music actually sound like? Oh boy. So for this bit here, I'll give you some examples of scene core songs and my personal issues with each of these. I'll start off with a song that I was first introduced to against my will, and I'm guessing some of you watching were too, because this song was trending a while back on scene TikTok. Horrible. Horrible app. Never again. But without further ado, let's get into everyone's favorite, Puke My Guts. Also, for all you headphone users out there, I'm sorry. Where do I even start? Like, I see what they're going for, but the execution just hurts. It's like they took all of the worst aspects of genres like crunkcore and happy hardcore and amplified them, while removing anything that made it remotely enjoyable. Like, crunkcore was infamous for using a lot of auto-tune and vocal effects, but at least that added something to the song and, you know, sounded good, at least to some extent. Like, I don't know if it's just me, but these vocal effects sound like nails on a chalkboard. And it's not just this song either. Almost every popular scene core song has this bizarre pitch and sound to the vocals and it, uh, I just don't get it. One more thing about the vocals before we move on. So I was scrolling through the comments and I found something interesting. This comment right here which says, The scream, I'm obsessed, and lists a timestamp. Now, if you're me and you missed this on your first listen, you might be pretty confused. But after replaying the timestamp a few times, I finally realized what they were referring to, which is this. Hey bestie. What the fuck was that? 
Okay, listen, I'm no fry screaming aficionado. <laughs> But that's not a fry scream. Like, in case you didn't know, fry screaming is a very specific technique that requires a lot of time and practice. But th this is clearly someone just whispering into the mic with a bunch of bad effects layered over it. I, I don't even- I, uh, I'm at a loss for words, man. Like, if these kids were to go to an actual metal concert, I think their heads would explode. Anyways, on to my next point of contention, because we're not done yet. The lyrics. Now, much like the shitty vocal effects and obnoxious instrumentals, this is a consistent theme throughout scene core music. Instead of being just a bit annoying, this one is much more concerning. It's a bit less egregious than some of the examples we'll be talking about here, but there's still a few weird lines that kind of rub me the wrong way. Lines such as, can you please stop touching my butt, watch me drink, oh please don't make me naughty, and I'm genuinely not comfortable saying this out loud. Now listen, I have no clue what this person's been through, and realistically, you can make songs about any topic you want. But the way that this kind of stuff is approached, and like, the tone of the song, I don't know man, it just makes me uncomfortable. Maybe if this was a one-time thing with this one particular artist, it wouldn't squick me out as much. But as I said before, you will start to see a pattern with all of these songs. But before we get into our next example, there's one more element of this song that I want to talk about. The instrumentals. Now, some of you might have picked up on this already, but these instrumentals aren't original. In fact, they're just a sped up version of the instrumentals from the song Pokey Po. As an avid Project Diva player, I can get down with some Vocaloid every once in a while, but there's something about Popey Po that always drove me crazy, so I guess my hatred for Puke My Guts is a bit biased. But back to the topic at hand, yes, these instrumentals are 100% stolen, zero credit given to. Now I get there's the whole debate about sampling and whatnot, but this is a tad bit ridiculous, don't you think? And once again, I wouldn't be so fixated on this if it wasn't for the fact that this is another thing that happens in almost every big scene core song. And this isn't even the only time that Poby Po has been stolen. In fact, there's another big scene core song that did the exact same thing. Except this song is even more vile than the last. And trust me, this is where shit really starts to hit the fan. Anyways, allow me to introduce you to the dreaded Freshman boyfriend. All you like is seniors. You better go a freshman. Yeah, that pussy's freshman. Running in my head when you see your ache of rest and you lifting up your skirt. <coughs> Sorry, that was an involuntary reaction. Anyways, let's unpack this disaster of a song. Much like Puke My Guts, the vocals sound terrible. Like, I'm not even gonna comment on that from now on, since it's pretty much just par for the course at this point. And, you know, the whole, it, it's just, it's just Popey Po again, you get the point. But my main problem here is with the lyrics because, oh my god, how does no one have a problem with this? I've heard people try to defend this song by saying, Oh, well, it's supposed to be through the perspective of a freshman, so it's fine. Like, are y'all forgetting that this was written by an entire adult? That's just blatant sexualization of minors. Point blank. Like, the concept of a freshman being attracted to other freshmen instead of seniors is just really weird in general, but why in the ever-loving fuck do they need to be so descriptive? Lines like, uh, Susan, please, for the love of God, don't kick me off your Christian Minecraft server. I'm just quoting people, I'm not endorsing any of this. <laughs> are just not okay. I don't care who you are or what type of music you make. Lines like these are just genuinely appalling. And even though Freshman Boyfriend is a very extreme example, a lot of these songs do contain a lot of weird fetishization, especially of scene kids. For example, like the line, I'm a little scene slut from Puke My Guts. Now you might be thinking, Maya, didn't like every crunk core song do that back in the day? 
Well, no, not exactly, mainly because those songs weren't about minors, but I digress. The main difference here was the fact that the people making those songs were also scene kids. And rather than fetishizing a group of people they were on a part of, was a celebration of their own subculture. Especially back in the 2000s when looking like this was a lot more taboo. It's very polarizing to say, hey, I think piercings are rad, or I think crazy fucked up hair is beautiful, or I think tattoos are hot. In a world where people like this were criticized and seen as ugly by the mainstream, it was really cool to see the subculture being celebrated, and once again, by other scene kids. But a lot of this scene core shit is just really weird. Case in point, pretty little scene slut. Okay, first of all, the instrumentals are fucking stolen again. Really? This just kind of feels like the big titty goth GF thing, except with scene kids. Like, why? Just why? And that's the entire song, too. It might just be a me problem, but this song kind of makes me feel sick. Like, I don't know what it is. Also, to all you scene core musicians out there, can you stop calling us little sluts? Because I've seen this a concerning amount of times. It makes my skin crawl just saying it. Like, if someone came up to me and said that to my face, I would jab them in the eyes and run away. No questions asked. Once again, this could just be me being oversensitive or whatever, but if you're seeing it, let me know in the comments. Also, I know I said I wouldn't talk about the vocals, but this is just the worst shit I've ever heard. Look, the vocals are off key, they're out of sync, and this dude sounds like he was falling asleep mid-recording. Once again, I know this is just my opinion, but like, I just, I just don't understand. I had to cut some other examples for time, but you pretty much get the gist of it. Most of this shit is just stolen instrumentals with bad, half-hearted vocals, terrible effects, and disgusting lyrics. You heard some of the topics I mentioned above, but some of the examples I had to cut included topics like these. Which are not isolated incidents, and are themes that tend to crop up a lot in these songs. But anyways, now that you know the caliber of garbage that the average scenecore kid listens to, you might be wondering, so what do they think about the old school stuff? Oh honey, hold on to your butts kids, this is gonna be some of the dumbest shit you've ever seen. So, a little while back, one of my friends got into an argument on Twitter. Once new. <laughs> But this particular argument was with a bunch of scene core people, and I think it gives some pretty good insight into how much these scene core kids actually respect the music. You know, the entire reason why they're able to exist today. All the names will be blurred out, by the way. Anyways, you can see here in this first tweet, this person says, And they say current scene core music is bad. Jesus, the fuck is this? And attached to this tweet is the link to One Freak and Freak by Dot Dot Curve. Now, I might be a tad bit biased on the matter, but terrible music taste and questionable purchases aside, Dot Dot Curve were pretty damn influential back in the day, and even then, this song was iconic. Whether it be the instrumentals, the somewhat bizarre song structure, even just like the always me, always me, I'll freak that, I'll fuck that, you know? It's also pretty ironic that they chose this song in particular too. Like, I can say all I want about Crunkcore, but we all know what it's mostly about. A lot of fucking. But this song in particular is about being a scene kid, more specifically being made fun of for the way that you look and act as a result. Like, I feel like this person had the chance to actually make a point here but they just chose to dig their own grave even deeper. And look, I'm not saying that Dot Dot Curve were the most talented, credible, prolific musicians to ever grace the scene. <laughs> no, not even by a long shot. But you can't deny the influence they've had over the years. Hell, even the scene core kids like this song to some extent. 
Did you really think I would forget about this? Even though I refuse to set foot there now, back on TikTok in late 2020, early 2021, there was a point where you couldn't go 10 seconds on your For You page without seeing a video that looked a little something like this. What song is the- what, what song is the- what, uh, Even though, in my opinion, this is one of the weakest parts of the song, and also the part of the song that is arguably aged the worst. Guys, why did we need to pick the one part of the song about shooting people? Put the gun down, spanky! No one cares that much about your stupid tight girl pants! Anyways, back to this Twitter drama. My friend responds to this person and says, actual scene music, the fuck? And this person's response is where this whole thread starts to go off the rails. That and Broken Side are easily the worst music I ever heard. Shit like Punk and Love, Heart Crush, and I'm not even gonna attempt to pronounce this, goes hard though. I think BOTDF is nice too. F fucking pardon? Bet you're the type of bitch to hate on blood on the dance floor and call people fake scene. Shut up, you wouldn't know scene culture if it weren't for TikTok. And then my friend rightfully calls them out on this and they respond with, blood on the dance floor is peak scene music. Who the fuck even cares about morals? <sighs> Will you excuse me for just a sec? <laughs> I didn't really want to talk about this topic, nor did I think I had to, but here we are. The bar was literally on the floor, yet you decided to tunnel underground. I don't even, I don't even know what to say anymore. Let's just, let's just do the thing. <laughs> I even start with this so if you don't know what blood on the dance floor is or what their lead singer dobby vanity has done i will have some resources linked in the description but to sum it up dobby real name jesus david torres turned out to be a huge pedo and ruined what is estimated to be upwards of hundreds of people's lives and this dude still isn't in jail he also tried to make a comeback on tiktok recently so make no mistake this man is still at large and dangerous. And even though in recent years there has been a much bigger effort to spread awareness about the horrific things that this man has done, even back in the day, everyone knew that this dude was a total creep. Hell, I know people who used to be seeing kids who were personally affected by this dude. That's terrifying. This monster has been a blight on my subculture for over a decade, and the fact that there are people who still support and promote his music makes me physically ill. Also, Blood on the Dance Floor's music is just trash, like, straight up. And that's coming from me, someone who makes liking bad music her entire personality trait. My Spotify is fucked, I have these cursed artifacts in my house, yet I still despise BOTDF's music. I have been wanting to make a needlessly thorough roast of Blood on the Dance Floor's music for a while now. Let me know if you'd be interested. But to keep this short, Dobby's voice is just so insufferable, their lyrics are disgusting and openly fetishize children, and a ton of their songs include stolen lyrics and instrumentals, some even being stolen, from young girls who were groomed by Dobby and promised credit. Actually, now I'm starting to understand why seeing poor kids like this dude. Like, even if morals somehow didn't matter in this case, why the fuck did y'all choose this band in particular to defend? What about those bands that I mentioned earlier, who made way better music and were, I don't know, normal people? Well, I mean, as far as I know, Spanky and j Rec were two completely normal dudes, but no, they're to be ridiculed because freaking freak is a bad dog. Don't make fun of blood on the dance floor or your fake scene. Like, what are you even on about, dude? Oh, also, another person joins and gives one of the weakest arguments I've ever heard, 
which is POTDF had a huge impact on scene culture, and people can't deny that. I do absolutely understand why people hate them, but there's no denying the impact they had, which is just not true, like at all. I feel like this is covered best in the Cozy Representatives video, which I'd highly recommend if you're interested in hearing about the Dobby Vanity situation from a scene kid's perspective. Also, this dude's like my favorite YouTuber, so show him some love. Anyways, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of Blood on the Dance Floor's music was stolen in some way, shape, or form. But especially in the beginning of their career, it's very obvious that entire themes or musical styles were just lifted from other artists who did it way better than they did. I also think it's important to point out that Blood on the Dance Floor came from the crunkcore scene specifically, which was pioneered by bands like Broken Side and Dot Dot Curve, which these people supposedly hate. But as pointed out by the Cozy Representative, a lot of early Blood on the Dance Floor just sounded like bad, slowed down, hello goodbye-esque instrumentals with knockoff dollar store Jeffree Star rap verses over them. And though Blood on the Dance Floor did eventually start to become its own thing, by the time that happened, it was around 2012, and by that point, the scene was pretty much dead. Anyways, this segment has gone on way longer than it should have. Dolby Vanity sucks, his music sucks, and there are so many better bands that you should be listening to instead. <laughs> That was a lot, so let's take a step back. We've been looking at this whole issue through a scene lens, mainly because that's what I know best, but this whole misunderstanding subcultures and adding things that don't fit thing hasn't just been happening with the scene. Now, I've been trying for a while now to figure out exactly why this is happening, and I still can't fully wrap my head around it, but I think I finally figured out the problem. It's what I've been rambling on about for however long I've been recording this. The music. Because without the core of the subculture, everything else falls apart. No message, no camaraderie, no reason for self-expression. It's just kids following trends just to seem cool. Or being posers, you know. Just saying. I think Jake Monroe puts this best in his video, Goth Reacts to Alt TikToks and Doesn't Cut Out the Rant. I'll play some clips here, but I recommend checking out the full thing. Kudos to the to the ones who are showing up in these compilations, listening to all kinds of different music, al alternative music that is not part of the algorithm. There's a lot of really, really good alternative music out there. I'm talking about like good modern music, good alternative bands that are struggling because kids just don't listen to it. I just don't understand. I used to look at alternative people as someone I could relate to, someone that despite no matter how different we are we would always have probably music overlapping that we could talk about i don't feel that anymore i see these alt kids now walking around in town and i see them online and i feel like they're literally just wearing a costume it's not like a representation of who they are they're just wearing a costume it's like tiktok core a really important point that jake makes here is how alt has kind of been commodified and how these kids just feel like they're copying aesthetics or wearing a Halloween costume rather than actually expressing themselves. Like, come on, man. You've never had your mutual friends and acquaintances stop talking to you because you look different or have your counselor be convinced that you're depressed or doing drugs or being bullied and having shit thrown at you or getting kicked out of a Forever 21 because they're convinced that you're shoplifting, which I work at the mall, so I don't know what they thought I was gonna do, but come on. And I'm not a hardcore goth, or punk, or even emo. I'm a scene kid. As colorful and non-threatening as you can realistically get, and I've still put up with this shit. And it just feels like a slap to the face for the same people who made fun of me to start dressing this way and get praised for it. Once again, textbook definition posers. Another point that Jake Monroe brings up is how real alternative music never permeates the mainstream anymore, and how these kids are never exposed to it, which is true. Almost all of the TikToks that he reacted to had all the same songs, and none of them were alternative. This comes back to the point I made earlier, which no music means no subculture. And no matter how these kids dress, 
there will never truly be a movement without music and a proper message to back it up. With the spread of TikTok and the image of the watered-down, conventionally attractive alt-girl, I don't think we're gonna get there anytime soon. Tying this all back to scene core, I think this is ultimately why it bothers me so much. Like, you have some semblance of a message, being cringe culture is dead, you have the fashion, that being the more anime slash decor inspired look, and you even have your own music of debatable quality. <laughs> so why do you insist on leeching off of us? Like, you have all the ingredients to make your own movement, your own subculture. So why do you force your interests into this box and then get mad at us when we try to explain that it's fundamentally not the same thing? I don't get it, dude. I, I really don't understand. And I did mention at the start of this video that I wanted this to be more of a discussion than anything else. So if you have a perspective that you would like to share or just general critiques, then I'd be happy to hear them. Even though I am very passionate about this, my opinions are definitely subject to change. So I'd love to discuss it with you guys in the comments. All right, well, if you made it to this point in the video, thank you so much. I hope you learned something or just enjoyed vibing with me for a little bit. I hope you have a great rest of your day. I'm tired, so I'm gonna go to bed. Take care.